In our teaching today, strangely enough, I'm going to talk about alcoholism and addiction. But I'm going to talk about alcoholism and addiction not in a way that uh, specifically is meant to treat or help uh, a person who is addicted to a substance. What I'd like to do is examine addiction, examine the idea of, of substance addiction or alcoholism and see how very much like the condition that we all find ourselves in, in samsara, it actually is. One of the things that I have been quite fascinated with, although I myself have never um, been involved in the program, um, I know people that have, and some of my best students actually have, I have been uh, fascinated with uh, the, uh, the program that is used by Alcoholics Anonymous, the 12-step program. Fascinated by it in that I, I can hardly believe, the more I learn about it, how completely compatible it is with the Buddhist teaching, how completely compatible it is with Buddhist thought. Now, I can't even say that about other religions. In fact, I can't say that about other religions. Uh, I, I myself saw His Holiness the Dalai Lama speak to the, um, the highest Episcopal bishops in the country and uh, have these bishops uh, say to His Holiness the Dalai Lama, well, we're all one religion anyway, and we basically believe the same thing. Now, you must understand, this is a man who is the head of a theistic religion talking to a man who is the head of a non-theistic philosophy. So, of course, His Holiness the Dalai Lama said, while I appreciate that there are certain things that we hold in common, such as the wish to benefit sentient beings, the wish to act compassionately, and these are the important things that we have in common, still, I must say, your religion and my religion are not the same, and it betrays both of them to pretend that they are. Because, in fact, the heart, and the heart of Buddhist uh, philosophy is the, the awareness of the primordial empty state, and that is not the heart of Christianity. The heart of Christianity is, is different than that, and the way that it's practiced is different than that. The technology is different than that. So there are some common denominators. But I, I can say that far more than other religions, a program like Alcoholics Anonymous is very, very similar to Buddhism, and I find that fascinating. I'm, I'm really quite taken with that. <clears throat> the reason why I would want to bring this up at all is because of the way, personally, I view samsara, or the cycle of death and rebirth, and the way that I have been taught to view samsara by my teachers. Also, I'm bringing it up because of the similarity in a certain point that, or inner posture that one has to get to, that each one of us has to get to in order to go further in either program, whether it be Buddhism or Alcoholics Anonymous. There is a certain point that one has to get to. That point is the recognition of the condition. That point is the recognition of one's state, the, the condition that one finds oneself in. Now, it, as, again, I, I know very little about Alcoholics Anonymous and any of you that wish to argue with me or contribute to what I'm saying are free to do so. But one thing I do understand is that generally it's considered that an alcoholic is, is not helpable, is really beyond help, until they bottom out. That means they get to a point where they are just disgusted. They see that their life is really falling apart and there is literally no other where to go. Than, than forward or up. There, there, is, there is a bottom that's reached. And many times during the history of an alcoholic, they'll reach low points, certainly, but they will not reach a point at which they bottom out. And it isn't until they reach that point that they are helpable. They have to f basically find themselves stripped down to a point where there is no other useful or, or, or beneficial or pleasant way to go. It's just the bottom. How else can you describe the bottom? It is the bottom. And it is at that point that alcoholics are helpable, that they can begin to help themselves. Am I right? Any of you guys that know about this? Okay. So, 
from that point of view, when an alcoholic's or, or, an, or an addict's life uh, becomes bottomed out like that, they are at the first good point they've been at for a long time. That may not feel like that to the alcoholic. To the alcoholic, it is the most deluded and confusing time. It is the most helpless of times. It is the, the time in which they have almost no skills, no, no, no resources, and, and they, are, they are quite helpless. But it is the first time where any benefit can actually happen. Now, why am I worrying about this? Am I thinking that maybe most of you in this room are alcoholics? Yes. Yes, I am. But maybe you don't drink. Let's see how that works. In samsara, we have the same condition. According to the Buddhist teaching, we are actually taking rebirth again and again and again. <coughs> Unfortunately, not with the prevailing idea that one finds in New Age kind of meta metaphysical thought these days. Most New Age metaphysical thought says that we choose our parents and we choose our circumstances and we're all in a learning situation and that sort of thing. The Buddha teaches us that, in fact, we experience rebirth due to ego clinging, due to desire. It isn't like a conscious choice where somewhere up in heaven, wherever that might be, or wherever these little unborn creatures are, uh, we look down, parting the clouds, of course, and pick a couple of parents out of the 4.8 billion thinking those would be nice. Or, I think I'd like to be beat up today. <laughs> or uh, whatever our particular situation. I'd like to go hungry, so I'll choose those. Uh, the Buddha doesn't indicate to us that that is the way it actually is. The Buddha indicates to us that we experience desire, and that desire is the cause of all suffering, and that the suffering takes the form of being, of experience rebirth under, uh, experiencing rebirth under certain conditions. In effect, it is our, our addiction to samsara that causes us to, reborn, to be reborn under certain conditions. It is true that we tend to come to parents with whom we have a very strong karma or previous cause and effect relationship. Uh, vibrationally, the parents will be somewhat like us. Now, before you all attack me with clubs and sticks, it's true. I know that you have spent years and years blaming your parents for everything, but I hate to tell you, it's true. We are like our parents in some way. Now, it's true, our parents might have beaten us to a bloody pulp, and maybe we don't do that to our children. And our parents might have been chudgers and blamers and things like that, or cold people, and perhaps we work very hard not to be like that with our children. But if we are really honest and really look at ourselves, we will find ourselves somewhat, in some way, vibrationally, like our parents. You cannot be born of a mother with whom you do not have a common vibration. It simply wouldn't work. Metaphysically, you would dissolve in the womb. It, it, it would never happen in the first place. So there is a likeness, likeness there, and there is no point in blaming your parents for what happened to you. The best thing to do is to look at the condition and content of your own mind and learn something that way. Now, what has led us to be reborn as we are are a series of cause and effect relationships based on the assumption of self-nature as being inherently real. With that assumption automatically and at the same instance that assumption takes place, we distinguish self from other. In distinguishing self from other, we automatically react toward self, toward other, with attraction, repulsion, or neutrality. Now, neutrality sounds like the best way to go, of course, but in samsara, neutrality comes about after this goes on, which means to say, you weigh out attraction, you weigh out repulsion, and somewhere in the middle of it, you're just like, eh, who cares? but it's still part of the same coin. In a sense, attraction is one side of the coin, 
repulsion is the same, uh, the opposite side of the coin, and neutrality may be the coin on its side, if you'll think of that. But they are part of the same thing. They are reactive. We, since time out of mind, have always been reacting with attraction, repulsion, or neutrality due to attraction and repulsion. And it all has as its root one of the three poisons. And that poison is grasping or desire or greediness. Desire. Um, we, we take rebirth due to ego clinging. We experience continuum, and you can only experience continuum as a self, because self is that which seems to move through linear time, and that is the experience of continuum. That's what we have. We have that condition, and it underlies everything, every internal, subtle, and gross process, every single one. It is that grasping that causes rebirth, simply that. Now, to give you a little esoteric background on this, when we enter into the bardo, which is the intermediate state between death and rebirth, <clears throat> we still experience continuum, because we still experience ego clinging, even though the elements have dissolved. And it is possible for us to awaken somewhat to the primordial wisdom nature. Yet because of ego clinging, and because of the idea that if we were to simply relax ego clinging, there would be no continuum which is true. That fear, that fear of that kind of chaos causes us to remain in the posture of that continuum and that ego clinging continues. In the bardo we experience many different things. We actually experience our own nature as the elements of the body and, and psychological makeup begin to dissolve. Yet even as we experience the primor primordial wisdom nature, we are unable to register <coughs> it in the same way that um, an aborigine who had never seen a mirror or a reflection would be unable to see his own face if he were given a mirror. He would not know what it was. The brain would not compute it. Something like that. In the bardo, we are unable to recognize our own nature. <coughs> we have no way to do that. So what we continue to do is to experience continuum habitually, as we do now. We see our nature, but it looks outside, just like our nature looks outside now, just like we see other, which is in fact our own nature. In the bardo, we see our own nature expressed externally. Those peaceful components of our nature we see as the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, the peaceful deities, it's true, but having no training to understand them, their light is too bright, they're frightening. They're like very loud sound that we've never heard before. It crashes on us. We can't understand it. We have no affinity to it because we're so deeply steeped in habitual tendency. We have no affinity for it, no, um, no recognition, no empathy with it. The more aggressive or, or moving, uh, when I say moving, I mean dynamic aspects of our personality, which have to do with activity, which have to do with movement, and often are the ones in which the very aggressive emotions fall, such as anger, such as that. <clears throat> Those are expressed as external also, and we see them as the wrathful deities. Yet the wrathful deities look to us monstrous. We become afraid. And so in the bardo, we seek something that gratifies us, something that gives us comfort, something that gives us release. And we actually find ourselves incarnating in a way that if we had not had such attachment to finding gratification or safety, we would have taken better time to choose. If we were not so blinded with our own habitual tendency, we might have chosen differently. So we take rebirth as many different kinds of life forms <clears throat> are unfortunately as humans who are drawn to circumstances that they might not have chosen but that they somehow vibrationally have attuned within them. We get born to parents that mistreat us or whatever. But it's a reflection of what we have inside of us and it is also a reflection of our own habitual tendency. So there's no point blaming anybody the point would be to get to work 
and to try to practice in such way as to accomplish dharma, to accomplish being able to recognize one's own nature without ego clinging. Now, <clears throat> in the Buddha Dharma, uh, it is considered that this is the problem, yes, and the problem continues life after life after life, that due to ego clinging we find ourselves in terrible circumstances. These circumstances, even at best, are impermanent. So even if we have a wonderful, happy, successful life, guess what? Unless you haven't looked in the mirror for a very long time, you can see that that life is progressing and that you know, some gray hairs are starting to show up and, and you know, uh, parts of our bodies are getting lower <laughs> all the time. And, and uh, you know, amazing things are happening here. Uh, unless we are not, we are totally out to lunch, we realize that no matter how good and successful and wonderful our life might be right now, it is drawing to a close. During the course of that life, have we used up a lot of accumulated merit? Maybe so. During the course of that life, have we done much to accumulate more merit? Maybe not. These are the things that we have to think about. But we are moving through our lives at any rate, and that's for sure. Now many of us also are not very happy. We don't know, we just don't seem to be able to master happiness. We are filled with longing, filled with, with sometimes anguish of different kinds. You know, loneliness, unhappiness, anger. Anger seems to be our constant companion. Uh, it just can't seem to shake it, you know. It comes back again and again and again. Loneliness comes back again and again and again. So we don't feel that we are particularly happy, even in this beautiful country and these beautiful places that we find ourselves sitting in we still find that we are terribly unhappy. And then what to think about those that are in different places, uh, in, in different countries, different, different life forms that are miserably unhappy. Happy or unhappy, we know that life is impermanent. We know that it is brought about by habitual tendency, which is scary. Have you looked at your habitual tendencies lately? Doesn't that make you just a little squeamish? I mean, if you think about it. So if life is brought about by habitual tendency and cause and effect is definitely what's happening here, we have to really sit down and study what we call in the Buddha Dharma the faults of cyclic existence. Now it's considered in Dharma teaching and in, and in Buddhist thought that without thoroughly examining the faults of cyclic existence and Honestly and courageously, and I have to underline the word courageously, because this is where most people fade out. So don't have courage here. You have to examine yourself honestly and courageously the way an addict does. You have to see your habitual tendencies. You have to see your pride. You have to see your anger and hatred. You have to come to terms with your clinging and <coughs> grasping. You must be able to look at it and recognize it in the same way an addict does. Because according to the Buddhist teaching, until we do that, we are going nowhere. I'm telling you that this is true. I know it is. Because I have many well-meaning students come here to study. And when they come here to study, their, their idea is, well, you know, I've been the spiritual route and I've, I've even taught a few things. And, <laughs> And I've, uh, you know, and I've, I've, I've done this and I've done that and I've read Maha Somebody and blah, blah, hoo, hoo and, and I've been through it all and I've even sat at the feet of, of Big Chief Somebody or other. And, and we all think that because of that, you know, we're coming in here and we're just listening to this lady in a yellow jacket and well, I'm just not that impressed. So, <laughs> come on, I can read minds, doesn't it just scare you? Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, let's say that happens. There are students that come to just about every kind of spiritual gathering in that way, with that kind of like arrogant posture, you know, arrogant posture, completely the avoiding the issue that it would be useful, beneficial, and just logical when you're in any situation like that to pick up a mirror and really honestly look at yourself. Really honestly look at yourself. That would be the normal thing to do. I mean, if, no, if you consider normal healthy, that would be the healthy thing to do. Maybe that's not the normal thing to do, but it would be the healthy thing to do. It would be the right thing to do. 
But instead, we, we seem to hold ourselves in a posture that makes everything that we're all about kind of up there in an unreachable place. You can't talk about it. You can't think about it. You can't argue with it. You just basically can't do anything with it. Now, according to both philosophies, the Buddha Dharma philosophy and the Alcoholics Anonymous philosophy, that makes you impotent. That makes you weak. And basically, that makes you in a position of still being pretty much a coward. Now, I'm really laying on the coward trip too much and the courageous thing a lot, and that's because I have all these men here that are just chomping at the bit to go to the Super Bowl, and I just think, I'm going to use the words that they understand. And then, no beer unless you follow this teaching. <laughs> it could work. I mean, I'll try anything, right? <laughs> so anyway, the idea that I'm trying to present is that you have to be at that place of total honesty. Now, in Alcoholics Anonymous, when you get to that place of total honesty, basically your life is broken down. In Buddha Dharma, when you get to that place of total honesty, you take apart your life, you break it down yourself. Because if you wait for samsara to totally break you down, first of all, who wants to wait? It takes too long. It just takes too long. Plus, you have been broken down before. According to the Buddha's teaching, you have died and been reborn uncountable times under very unfortunate circumstances. And nudnik that we are, we still haven't gotten it. We just can't get a grip. For some reason, the way that samsara is constructed, it's very much like a narcotic. It's like being under the influence of the drug or under the influence of the alcohol. While you're really loaded, you really just don't know you're behind from a table. You just can't find anything. You just can't figure it out because the drug is in your system. The whole time while we are revolving in samsara, in a sense, that drug is in our system because we always view, don't we, through the experience of continuum. And we always view with the assumption of self-nature being inherently real. So we are fueled by this alcohol of the desire of continuum in a certain way to experience as ego. We can't see clearly. Now that happens to the alcoholic too. And so one of the steps of alcohol, and again, I don't know the program well enough to know which step is which or what comes first. I'm, only re I'm relying mostly on the Buddha Dharma to, to tell me what to do. But once you have decided the faults of cyclic existence, and you really have to spend some bone-crushing time on that one, and that is not your favorite part of the practice. I mean, get this. It's not the part you're going to enjoy. And it isn't the one where you can sit on a high mountain in the Himalayas with your hands just right, and your, and your, and your feet in the lotus position, and think of yourself as very holy while you're doing. You're not going to get a lot of gratification at that point. Same with the alcoholic. When they decide that they are really bottomed out, that is not a gratifying time. I mean, am I right? That is the worst, most horrible time that one can possibly imagine. But in practice, one has to do that also. And you feel a little bit like you're going crazy. So you have to dismantle everything you held to be sacred. And you have to really look. But you're helpless unless you do. So the next step, as I understand it, in, in the Buddha Dharma is to decide that in samsara, and this is one of the faults of samsara, as it is one of the faults of drug addiction or alcohol abuse, is that we are, in this condition, helpless to change. Now, boy, we hate that in America. Man, this, this is the worst, because in America we're very democratic, we like to think that everybody's got power, we can all vote, so that makes us happy, although I don't know what good it's actually doing us. But anyway, we feel in America that we are really, really, really democratic in our thinking. We want to, to really, really think that, that we have something very powerful. But in fact, you have to get to the point where you can't stop. You're helpless. You're helpless. And then the next step in both the Buddha Dharma and in addiction is to take refuge in a higher power. Now, in... in Alcohol addiction, as I understand it, one takes refuge, in a sense, in one's sponsor, who is no longer 
under the influence of the drug and who has been the same route, who is basically, as the Buddha has done, although I don't think most of them are Buddhas, to tell you the truth, but as the Buddha has done, cross the ocean of suffering in a boat that works. That's the relationship. And that's how we see our gurus. Basically, it's not a personality cult. They have crossed the ocean of suffering in a boat that works. It's the same thing with your sponsor in alcoholism. They have crossed that ocean of suffering in a boat that works. So you take refuge in them, and you take refuge in the system or the teaching. And that's what you do. You also, in, in, in Alcoholics Anonymous, would take refuge in like in God, if you believed in God, or, or Jesus, if you, felt, if you felt yourself to be a Christian. Or again, if you're a Buddhist, you would take refuge in the Buddha's enlightened mind and in one's guru. So it's like that. And there, the similarity is very, very, very much the same. And then the rebuilding starts to go, st starts to come from that. The recognition of the fault of cyclic existen existence, the fault of your addiction. The recognition of the horrible bottomed out condition that we find ourselves in, both applying to samsara and to the addiction and the taking refuge and then day by day working it through in a very real, hands-on, uh, cut-to-the-bone way. That's really basically, and of course this is the serial box-top version, but that is basically the Buddhist teaching. The Buddhist teaching is about giving you a workable model or a workable vehicle that you can work through and actually get from one place to another. It's very real and it's very not flaky or pie in the sky. One of my biggest arguments with a lot of religious systems that I've seen is that there's no way to make it work. There's no applicable technology and it's too esoteric, too pie in the sky. Now certainly in Buddhism there is definitely esoteric philosophy. There is definitely uh, the more profound view that one has. But the basis of the practice is, in fact, working through, working th applying the technology to solve the problem. And it is that. It is a model, a technology that solves the problem. The good news is that you can get somewhere with it. You can actually accomplish something that you may not have been able to accomplish before. Isn't that scary that there are so many things in our lives that we can actually uh, be caught up in and not be able to accomplish? And that has happened to us, hasn't it? I mean, how many people amongst us, uh, yourselves, think about yourselves, uh, have you been addicted to anger? That constant anger that accompanies us when we constantly have hostility, anger, uh, hatred, really, uh, do you have anger every day? Then you are an anger addict. Have you ever decided you're not going to be angry anymore? Have you tried that? <laughs> Wasn't that a funny day? <laughs> so you're an anger addict and you find yourself in the same position. And when your anger gets just ugly enough and you begin to see the playback from it, maybe, maybe you'll find yourself in a position where you can change something. What about your lust and grasping? Have you, do you have lust and grasping every day? Then you're a lust and grasping addict. That's the truth. I didn't make this up. You're a lust and grasping addict. Are you like needy? Are you needy? Then you're a needy addict. It's not different. You have to think like that. Now with alcohol or, or drugs, the, 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 the nature of the beast there is that you're going to hit bottom. At some point, things are really going to fall apart. The pro one of the additional problems with samsara is that we can be angry every day, we can be needy every day, we can be miserable beyond belief every day. But it may not bottom out until we die. And right before we die, we kind of look back at our lives and go, gee, you know, I've been miserable and angry and needy just about every day here, and now I'm dying. <coughs> you know, I mean, what are you going to do about it then? You know, think about it. You're going toes up into the bardo, and, and you're going to be faced with the nature, with your mind, with your habitual tendency. 
So uh, the problem with samsara is even more acute. I think samsara is even more a drug than heroin, even more a, a, a damaging substance than addiction or damaging condition than addiction to alcohol. And the reason why I think that is because in samsara, the way it plays out, <coughs> even though things have fallen apart, even though we have bottomed out, even though we are utterly miserable, we often can't see it because we've been taught that that's simply the way it is. That's simply the way it is. So like an addict that changes bars in order to solve his unhappiness. <laughs> and it happens, doesn't it? You go from one kind of social scene to another kind of social scene thinking that it'll help. Like that, we go from day to day trying to solve the problem of samsara by bending the elbow a little more. And that's kind of how it goes. Now the situation that we find ourselves in is, is very similar to that. And in terms of being addicted to samsara, we have to really dismantle the delusion of samsara. We have to see the faults of it. Now according to the Buddhist teaching, there are certain pre-written faults of samsara that you can rely on, but I really recommend that you look very carefully at your own condition in a, in a courageous way. Now, I don't think that that can happen very easily on your own, because you're going to miss some things, a lot of things. It is remarkable to me, for instance, how, let's uh, use a hypo hypothetical situation that I ran into just recently. Let's say you have a friend, and probably you've seen this, who has a habitual tendency of terribly destructive relationships. Do you know anybody like that? How about yourself? <laughs> terribly destructive relationships in which it never happens that your friend walks out of a relationship unscathed. They always come out of it damaged in some way terribly destructive relationships. It seems to be a, a big item here in samsara. It's like a big seller. It's right up there with t-shirts. Big seller. <laughs> so we're in a terribly, a terribly addictive relationship. And then you see this person go into another terribly destructive relationship. The woman looks different. She smells different. She sounds different. How is it possible that she's exactly the same as all the other ones he's had? And you want to say to your friend, wham, 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 don't you see that you're doing it again? And they don't. They have, no, not a clue, nary a clue. Now, has that ever happened to you? Not a clue. Have you ever seen your friend do that? Have you ever seen yourself do that? It's the same song again and again and again. So you may need to get with someone who is a little bit more advanced at this than you are, or at least someone you can talk to, someone you can trust. I actually recommend that for my students. I set up a system where they can do partnering with each other. And it's a useful thing because we can look at each other's patterns and we can look at where each other's thinking has just sort of slid over a few very important facts. And we can point it out and really help each other to stay honest because we don't have the habit of honesty we have the habit of patching things up and putting band-aids on them. That is our habit. We're trying to slick by, Jack, and that's what we're doing. So what we need to do is to try to find a way to cut to the bone, and you may need a friend to do that with. Now, if any of you wish to begin to engage, those of you that are my students and those of you that are thinking of becoming students, to, to engage in such a practice of really dismantling your habitual tendencies, to really look at uh, the, suffer the faults of cyclic existence and to really get with that, I heartily suggest that you do so. And certainly any of you are welcome to call on any of my students, to, uh, and those, of, those of them uh, that have been with me for some time and have some of those skills, and I'm sure they would be willing to help you. We're set up to do that. We're like that. And there's nothing to be shy about. I ha the one thing I have to tell you about this is that Whatever you've done, I know these people, they're worse. <laughs> uh, there's, no, there's not a rose amongst them. <laughs> Although they're looking pretty sweet these days. 
There's not a rose amongst them, believe me. There's not, not one amongst them that probably hasn't done worse. So there's nothing to be afraid of. You don't, the, the, the deal is, and, and, and here's something that's really important, in both Alcoholics Anonymous and in the Buddha Dharma, there's a, confession and remorse are essential components. Isn't that true? In Alcoholics Anonymous and, and, in, and, and both in Dharma. A uh, couple of them are over there. <laughs> I guess you noticed I'm looking over there. I don't know who's over there. but How many of you have been in the AA program that are willing to say so? Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Then you know what I'm talking about. So in our program, it's the same thing. In our program, remorse and confession are really important. Now in AA, are you supposed to uh, confess so that you could feel like a real jerk? That really isn't the point, is it? No, it isn't. And it's the same thing in Buddha Dharma. The point of confession is not so that you can beat yourself with or wear a hair shirt or something like that, you know, mea culpa or whatever. It isn't like that. It really isn't like that. The point of confession and remorse is truth. The point of confession and remorse is that you can't go forward while you're hiding something. And that's true in our practice. We can't. Those of you that find yourself stuck in your practice, don't you know that that's why? You can't go forward while you're hiding something. We do hide things. We pretend that we are, you know, Miss Nun Goodbar or something like that. <laughs> trying to think of an appropriate terminology, but Miss Little Angelic Nun or Mr. Uh, Mr. Wonderful Monk or none of the monks are here. That's scary. Where are they? Well, I guess they're not such angels, are they? Anyway, um, you pretend that you're, 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 you're Miss Wonderful, oh, I've got it together practitioner. And that's where you stop, that's when you stop practicing. That's when you're finished. Spiritually, you are finished then. You might as well dig a hole and jump in. And it's the same with addiction, isn't it? The minute you decide that, you've, that you're, what's the problem? And that happens to addicts, actually. They'll go through the program and they'll sober up and they'll get there for a while and suddenly they say, well, really, I, I'm pretty good now. I don't think I have a problem anymore. The minute you decide you don't have a problem anymore, you've got a big problem because you're about to start drinking again. You're going to do something that's going to find you in the same hole. Isn't that true? Isn't that true? Well, it's the same with our practice. It's the same with our practice. So we're constantly involved in confession and remorse. That's constantly a part of our practice. We're constantly involved in, in, in dismantling cyclic existence and looking at its faults. We are constantly involved in seeing the truth. Is an addict's life easy? Is recovery easy? No. That's why we have to do it one day at a time. And it's the same with our practice one day at a time, because it's not easy. But the thing about it that really makes you realize you've got to do it is that if being a recovered alcoholic is not easy, then being a drunk is much harder, because it's awful, it's not acceptable. It's simply not acceptable. Do you agree? It's not acceptable. You can't live like that. And it's the same thing with samsara. To work through samsara as a proper Buddhist practitioner, to catch that boat and take it to the other side is not easy. Honesty is required, but it makes you potent. That honesty potentizes your practice, it makes it possible. The alternative of just drifting and wandering aimlessly through samsara, like a person who is blind trying to get through a room full of obstacles, is simply not acceptable experiencing death and rebirth and coming out of it with only your habitual tendency every time since time out of mind is not acceptable. Once we have achieved a state of happiness and that can only happen when samsara is completely dismantled then we consider that we are moving toward enlightenment. The good news about all of this that even in Alcoholics Anonymous, you never, you never are actually totally recovered, and you never stop thinking of yourself as an addict that has to think in a certain way. The one thing that we have to consider that the Buddha has taught, that takes it one step further, and that as an addict we should all consider, is that there is an end to suffering. And that end to suffering is called enlightenment. 
that it's going to be hard work maybe isn't the best news you've ever heard. We all want to say, I want a religion in which you just call on somebody and they just save you. Everybody wants that. But that's like an addict saying, I want a drug that's just going to feel good forever. It's never going to happen. It's never going to happen like that. I wish it would. I'd like to give that to you. But it's not. However, the Buddha teaches there is an end to suffering, and that is called enlightenment. The state of enlightenment can only be described as a state free of desire. Now, if an addict no longer had any desire, if it could be rooted out of his mind or her mind totally, so that there was no desire at all, that could be likened to a state of recovery. But enlightenment is much more like, much more than that. There is no ego clinging. There is the realization of the primordial empty state. There is the recognition and awakening to that nature. And that's how the Buddha described himself. I am awake. He didn't say, I'm a great and powerful guy. He didn't say, I am the wizard of Oz. <laughs> he didn't say that. He said only and simply, I am awake. Awake to the true nature, which in fact is free of craving. Your true nature, no matter how addicted you are now, is free of craving. Enlightenment is like that. Those of you that are involved in AA, stay right where you are. Don't budge an inch. But I want you to know that what we do here is compatible. You can do them both. For those of you that are not involved in AA, you should be. <laughs> Even if you don't drink or use drugs. And you should think the same way that they think. The model works. And guess what? The Buddha has the same model going on. That's why I trust it. It's very, very similar. So please, this is, you know, I guess, I hope I get a card from AA. <laughs> they just, you know, I hope that, hey, wow, we heard that you are advertising us and we are so happy for you. But that's not the point. That's not the point. That really, I swear to you, that is not the point. The point I'm trying to make is that we have an addiction, that samsara is an addiction. It is an addicted situation. We are addicts. We've got to get the big picture. We've got to get a grip here. And there is method. There is a way. And you're not alone. And that's a good thing, because you can't do it by yourself. You can't. So please take that to heart. I hope that you can use that and, and use it thoroughly and use it well. And thank you very much for coming today. Uh, I, so guys, you have to admit, I did not actually keep you late. You will get home in time for Super Bowl. <laughs>